necessitists think that life is the inevitable and necessary product of the laws of physics and chemistry. Given a universe controlled by our physical and chemical laws, it is inevitable that somewhere life will originate. Contingentists, by contrast, say no, the existence of life on Earth is a highly contingent event that depends upon a conspiracy of highly improbable conditions that might not have obtained on any other planet in the observable universe. So you've got necessitists and contingentists with regard to the origin of life. And it seems to me that the theologian can adopt either one of these perspectives. You could be what I would call a theological necessitist. Namely, you would hold that... Let me begin by saying what a tremendous privilege uh, it is for me to participate in this conversation with Jim Tour, who is uh, an eminent uh, synthetic organic chemist uh, and a specialist in our topic today. Indeed, uh, one might wonder what I, as a philosophical theologian, could possibly have to contribute to a conversation like this, given Jim's expertise. And I think there's a twofold contribution that I'm able to make. First of all, I'm able to bring a theological perspective to the question of the origin of life. And that complements, I think, or supplements Jim's scientific perspective. Jim has endured an enormous amount of um, personal invective and abuse for his personal religious views. And what people don't seem to understand about his work in this area is that, in fact, as a scientist, uh, Jim Tour is a methodological naturalist. That is to say, he doesn't include religion or God in his science. He has said explicitly that um, I never appeal to God to explain the origin of life. I don't even appeal to intelligent design. He said, as a scientist, I would never say that we will never be able to explain naturally the origin of life on this planet. Rather, he simply remains agnostic about how life originated. He says, we're clueless about how life originated uh, on this planet. And that is the appropriate um, conclusion for a methodological naturalist. And so what I can do is to bring some theological perspective to the question here, because I'm not a natural scientist. I'm a theologian. And so I come to the table with uh, belief in the existence of God already in hand and want to ask, how can I, as a Christian theologian, best integrate Christian theology with the best deliverances of contemporary science? The second thing I think that I can contribute is that you will discover that in talking with professional scientists like Jim Tour, technical jargon is so second nature to them that it can sometimes be very difficult for them to explain these concepts in terms that laymen can understand. And as a layman myself, I hope that perhaps I can contribute to the communication of these highly technical ideas in ways that uh, our listeners can understand today. So let me, let me actually start, Dr. Tour. I'm, I'm going to bring you in here. I, I, I want to ask you a question, and we may cut this out and put this in a, a little short clip, but has science figured out how life began? No, not even close. Not even close. Why is that? Well, we, we, we still haven't come up with a prebiotic route to the basic four classes of chemicals that we need. We need four basic classes of compounds, uh, the nucleotides, the carbohydrates, the amino acids, and the lipids. Nobody, nobody has ever used a prebiotic route 
to get at those compounds where they have been enantiopure or even high enantiomeric excess. Then you have to polymerize them and it's very hard to polymerize them. We've never come up with a prebiotic route to polymerize them cleanly where we are controlling the, the relative chemistries that are needed to, to couple these together. And then once you've done that, you've got to somehow get them integrated into a living system. So even if, if people have tried to pack these things into a vesicle, but they, they don't start running any more than you could take the parts of a car and throw it inside the, the uh, you know, into the driver's seat and expect the, 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 the engine parts to start working. They have to be integrated in together. So, so all of this together becomes a real problem. And, and uh, um, uh, so far, we're not even close. What people have done and claimed synthetic cells is to take a working cell already and make a copy of its genome outside the cell remove the the initial genome and put the copy of the genome into that cell and the cell started operating but the cell was already in place and that's what they call the synthetic cell but the life was already there they just put in a different computer control chip if you will uh figuratively uh in 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 inserting a new the the facsimile the copy of the genome so that that's what was called synthetic a synthetic cell but that's that's not making life they they already started with an existing cellular life we're so far from being able to do this yeah and, and shouldn't scientists like uh, shouldn't they be able to agree and at least in principle with your answer here like you're, you're not saying that you know therefore uh, naturalism is false or anything like that. You're just saying that as of the current status of things, we don't have the, that answer and that's okay. Like we maybe it's fine to not have an answer. Like, can't we just admit that? Yeah, I, I think it's fine to not have an answer and to say we are nowhere close because, because nobody knows how to put those parts together to get them function again. And when you haven't made the four classes of chemicals and people will say, well, look, I read, read this paper. But then when you look at the details of the paper, the regiochemistry was all different. They never used enantiopure materials. The homochirality of the polymers was not there. And so none of those parts could ever work anyway. So when you, when you box them in, when you say, okay, I'll give you all the parts. We'll take an existing cell. We will extract from it something that's come from a natural living system. We will extract from the, the DNA, the RNA, the peptides, the, 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 the polypeptides, which are all your enzymes and all your proteins, and then the, the carbohydrates, the polysaccharides, we'll extract from that. And so then also embedded in that is the key information on how to put these things together, because without the informational code, you're lost. And so well, it's already got the informational code because it's already come from a living system. Even if I just gave you those parts, could you mm. put a cell together? And when they're in that corner, they will agree they cannot. They do not know how to do that. So uh, uh, they'll hum and haw and they'll, they'll shuffle around, but then they'll say, no, we, we can't do that. So you would think that they would say, yes, we're, we're very far from this, but they keep saying we're very close to this. And I don't know why they do that. And, and as a scientist, it's not that, that I, I'm trying to be, you know, this, this grand grand explan uh, explanation here, give it a grand explanation. I truly cannot say that we will never solve this thing in a materialistic fashion. How can I say that? Scientists cannot predict the future. How do I know? If you had asked a person in the year 1700, would we ever understand where this information in a cell is stored such that when two parents are tall, their child is tall? And they just said, no, we, 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 don't, we don't know how. Uh, they would, have, would, would not have been able to fathom it. And then, then, then in the 1950s, DNA was discovered, the structure of DNA and how this code works within the DNA. And so now we understand. So several hundred years, you can have phenomenal changes. And the, and the, the rate at which human knowledge, information in human systems, the, the amount of information that, 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 that humans gather doubles every two years. By that, I mean, what took us 5,000 years of human history to accumulate will be doubled in two years from now. 
That's how fast information is accumulating. So all I can say is one day, one day we might know how, but we are nowhere close yet. So Dr. Craig, are there any theological implications of that kind of answer to this question? I think there are, but let me comment on something else that Jim has said. I want to underline for our listeners that Jim Tour is not some kind of a radical uh, conservative in saying this. Rather, the opinion that he has expressed is the judgment of many mainstream origin of life researchers. And I just collected a couple of examples for our listeners today. For example, the first one comes from Pierre Luisi, who is a Swiss um, origin of life researcher. In his text, The Emergence of Life, an important text on this subject, he says, you can have all the low molecular weight prebiotic compounds in the world, but you will not start life without ordered macromolecules. Those are those molecules Jim was talking about, the polypeptides, the polysaccharides, the nucleic acids. He says, it is one of the unanswered questions, and it is a question that is not taken seriously enough in the literature. The fact remains that there has been no way to obtain ordered sequences by prebiotic means. Another origin of life researcher, Harold Morovitz, uh, Morovitz, sorry, um, in his book, The Origin and Nature of Life on Earth, says we currently have essentially no understanding of what laboratory conditions would reproduce the emergence of life, which is exactly what Jim Tura said. Finally, I just read uh, this week James Shapiro's book, this monster tome, uh, evolution. He's at the University of Chicago, and he says, with regard to the origin of life, that our understanding of this is nil. Uh, those are his words. So the position that Jim is articulating here is one that is frequently voiced in uh, the literature on the origin of life and is not some sort of radical right-wing position. The other thing I wanted to say quickly is that Jim did use a couple of words that are technical jargon that most of our listeners won't be familiar with. For example, he talked about uh, enantiomeric purity or enantiomeric excess. Now, what in the world is an enantiomer? An enantiomer is like a right and a left-handed glove. It's a molecule uh, or two molecules that are mirror images of each other but they cannot be rotated in such a way that they coincide. You cannot convert a right-handed glove into a left-handed glove by rotating it in space. And one of the intriguing things about uh, the origin of life is that, for example, in these amino acid chains that form proteins, they're all left-handed. Uh, well, all of them that our anatomers are left-handed. All the anatomers are left-handed. Uh, and for that to occur simply by chance is virtually impossible. So explaining how you have these uh, anatomers all lining up in the same way is one of the great unanswered questions. Now, Jim also mentioned something called vesicles. What are vesicles? Well, Origin of life researchers have exhibited enormous ingenuity in trying to explain how the original first cell formed. Life doesn't begin until you have cellular life. And the present cells that exist today are breathtakingly complex, far too complex to have come together by chance. And so these researchers envision that there might have been proto-cells uh, and these are sometimes referred to as vesicles. This would be like an oil droplet that forms automatically in, in water. If you drop oil into water, and especially if you agitate it, you get these little globular vesicles. And the idea is that one of these vesicles kind of engulfed these um, biomolecules and formed the first protocell, and somehow that got cellular evolution underway and going. And so, again, 
uh, what Jim is emphasizing is that that doesn't even come close to explaining the origin of cellular life and the complex functions in a cell. In fact, a, a vesicle uh, will not do the trick. One of the problems with vesicles is that their membrane surface or their surface is impermeable. And so there wouldn't be any way for the cell to get in nutrients and put out waste. Uh, so I hope that makes it a little more comprehensible to our listeners uh, what Jim was talking about. Did so I get Jim, you, do you right? have any? He's just no, staring. <laughs> no, I, I, I thought that, that that was fine. I You're really impressing me. Uh, 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 Bill, this is this is amazing what you just just uh, explained. You've come a long way. Uh, I watch your videos and read your articles. <laughs> so so uh, but but I, I just want you to know, Bill, that when when I listen to your debates, I don't understand what you're talking about. I mean, you got all these philosophical terms and and, and yeah. it, it, I really have to stop and, and, and play it back again and again to make sure I got it. So so. Uh, um, you know, when I when I speak my jargon, I'm just getting you back. Uh, OK, fair enough. I, that's All really right. true. That everybody who specializes in a field begins to use terms like epistemology and metaphysics yes. and things yes. of that sort almost unconsciously. And it inhibits communication. But you asked me, uh, uh, Cameron, yeah. whether or not there's a theological perspective on the origin of life. And one of the most basic, absolutely basic distinctions I think that the theologian needs to make is the distinction between physical life, which is what the scientist is exploring, and non-physical life. Theologically, there is such a thing as non-physical life. God, finite spirits, Human souls are alive, and yet they're not physical entities. The most solemn oath in the Old Testament that God uses is, as I live, says the Lord, and then he will make some utterance. So God is a living being, but he's not a physical being. And so fundamentally, we've got to distinguish between physical life and non-physical life. And theologically, the origin of all life is God. God is the origin of a non-physical life. He was there in the beginning. And then the opening chapter of Genesis describes how God created life on this planet. Originally, the earth was, in Hebrew, tohu wa bohu, an uninhabitable waste. And then over the next four days, it describes how God transforms the earth to be a habitable biosphere for humans to live in. So theologically speaking, I think we want to say that God is the source of both non-physical and physical life. Dr. Craig, do you have any questions for Dr. Tour? Um. This One is your chance. Come to mind right away, Cameron. I had expected you to ask the questions. Uh, um, I have some more things to say, but they're not in the form of questions. So why don't you give? Yeah, Jim yeah, a no, to, no to problem. React. Yeah, Doctor Tour, is there uh, anything you'd like to say with respect to what Doctor Craig just said? Well, uh, something that a lot of people ask me, and I, I try not to answer it because it's hard for me to get into other people's heads. I have enough trouble figuring out why I do and say some of the things that I do and say, let alone other people. But they often ask me, why is it? Why is it that, that so many scientists are seeing what you see, but not saying it? And, and I think this is certainly true. The origin of life people themselves, some of them are really good chemists, I mean, really good chemists. And they, they see what I see, but they, they don't say that they'll say something, they'll, they'll make up a, 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 a uh, once upon a time story, and, and, and talk about how, how this could have done that. And perhaps this has done that, rather than saying all the, the many, many problems that, that there would be. And why is it 
that the community is not speaking up. I certainly can understand why people would see it and say nothing because they don't want to be attacked like, like I have been attacked. But why is it that these people who work in the area are seeing it and saying something totally different? Why do you think that is, Bill? Oh, my goodness. I, I am not sure, but I, I want to underline what you just said. I saw the most remarkable statement by Albert Eschenmoser about the origin of life and the failure to provide plausible scenarios for the origin of life on this planet. And his answer was that it is not the goal of origin of life research to explain how life originated on Earth, nor even how life could have originated on Earth. And therefore, the failure to do that is not a failure of the project. Rather, he says the purpose of origin of life research is just to show that living things can be assembled out of inanimate organic matter. And when I read that, I thought, well, that's absurd. We know just from our own existence that that can be done, that animate living things can be made up of inanimate material. We know that without any research whatsoever. And so this was, I think, the ultimate kind of buck passing with regard to the failure of this project is to say that it's not a failure because it doesn't really try to explain how life could have originated on this planet. Well, well, then, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for Albert Eschenmoser. I have yes. read his work since I was a graduate student. And, and uh, but yes, Albert Eschenmoser tried to make, tried to make ribose so that he could start to build RNA. He was unable to make ribose. All he could make was the six-membered ring sugars rather than the five-membered ring sugars. And so he started to try to make an analog of ribose and to say, well, you, you know, this, this will just streamline what we're doing. So he was totally unable to push this thing forward. Now, mind you that Albert Eschenmoser is in his 90s now. If, he's, if he is still alive, he's probably in his mid-90s. And he did this work, he, you know, I'm, I'm citing work that he even did in the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, uh, it's, it's come further than where he was at this time, but he had a terrible time with it. But that's very interesting. I have heard it said that we, we're not trying to explain how it occurred. We just have to explain how it might have occurred. Yeah. But now he's he saying... He denies even that. He did. He denies even that. So, so, so that that's a total confession that 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 even that cannot be explained. So, uh, yeah. um, he's gar gone even f further to make it into a, a, an answer where he can claim success, as as you put it, because we yeah. already know that we're here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me say one thing about uh, for our listeners' sake, what Jim said about the importance of. Eschen Moser's failure to synthesize this uh, ribose. Um, ribose is the sugar constituent of DNA and RNA. It's called deoxyribose nucleic acid. And so this is uh, one of those building blocks of the building blocks of life. The nucleic acids, the DNA, the RNA, are tripartite macromolecules that have a nitrogenous base, uh, a phosphate, uh, and a sugar, which is ribose. And in Eschenmoser's case, not only could he not synthesize the DNA, the nucleic acid, of course not, he couldn't even make the ribose, which is just one of the, the, the building blocks of the building blocks as Jim has emphasized. One of the interesting things about Jim's work that does, I think, stand out is that while I think most of the origin of life researchers I've read would agree that we have no understanding of how the uh, heavy molecular weight macromolecules essential for life were formed, namely those uh, 
nucleic acids, the polysaccharides, the polypeptides, and the lipids. Those are your fatty acids. Uh, nevertheless, they would say that we do know how the building blocks of these building blocks came to be. Amino acids, for example, are common in nature. They're found on meteorites. Um, similarly with uh, sugars, uh, these can be found naturally. Uh, and what Jim, I think, has contributed to the discussion is a profound skepticism that we even know how to synthesize the building blocks to make the building blocks. Um, and that, that is, I think, a, an important point that he's making. Yeah, so I, I can elaborate on that. that, that um, if you consider the amino acids, the, the experiment of Miller and Urey in the mid-1950s was really an amazing experiment to take small molecules, put high voltages across it and, and distilling them up and, and heating the solution. Uh, and he got out a number of amino acids. People have gone back and analyzed some of these mixtures and of the 20 amino acids, he may have gotten 10 of them. But the problem is that he got many, many other compounds along with it. That's a problem. And none of the compounds that he made were had an optical purity or an enantiomeric excess as so in other words you had both handedness you had the 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 left-handed and the right-handed there now there are two amino acids that can self crystallize into into a, a a pure form such that you would just get the l amino acid the other ones don't do that they they crystallize as pairs of both the right-handed and the left-handed However, you can get some of the, 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 those other amino acids that don't crystallize well to crystallize on the surface of those first two amino acids that can self-crystallize into pure form. But if you look at the yields of those, they are very, very small. It's less than 1% of them. So in other words, if you have a mixture that's 50% right-handed and 50% left-handed, and 1% of one of those hands, say the right-handed, crystallizes out, you still have the, the vast majority of the mixture is still racemic. You still have the vast majority of the right-handed and left-handed mixture. Plus, these are mixtures. That is a huge problem. We find on meteorites, on meteorites, you can sometimes get very sophisticated molecules. Lots of molecules come in on meteorites, but, and they're never in high purity. And so what happens, not only do you get the left-handed and the right-handed most of the time, sometimes you can get a little bit of excess of one over the other. Sometimes it's as high as what I've seen, say numbers of 70% uh, enantiomeric excess, which is still not good enough for a biological system. But let's just say, say these are what you get. They come as mixtures of many compounds. Like when you made these amino acids, they're mixtures. And why is this a problem? It's a huge problem because you can't get the chemistries to go on mixtures. It's like taking 10 different paint colors and mixing them together. And, and so now you have a, a beaker where you've mixed together all these different paint colors. And you say, well, now I just want to somehow pull out the, 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 red, the red dye that is in there. It's very hard to do that. Now we have instruments that can do that, but it's, it's extremely hard. No way on a prebiotic earth could these be fished out. Same problem with what comes in on meteorites. All the sugars that have come in on meteorites, the, the, uh, uh, the nucleotides that have come in on meteorites, they're all heavily uh, mixed together. Nobody has ever reproduced those mixtures. So what comes in is very small amounts because most of what comes in is going to burn up. But, but uh, uh, even you could reproduce those mixtures in a laboratory. You could say, okay, it has these 400 compounds. So, okay, we'll make those or we'll buy those 400 compounds on earth and we will mix them all together can I use that mixture for anything? And the answer is no, because one molecule conflicts with another. The other problem with the amino acids now hooking together, even if you had all 20 amino acids, you have to now somehow get them separated. If you wanna leave them together, what happens is you can't cleanly hook them together because they're, they don't just have two prongs, an A and a B coupling to an A and coupling to an A and a B. 
They don't do that because you also have a C prong there too. So half of the amino acids have a C prong that end up getting in the way. They end up coupling in the main chain. So all bets are off. Nobody has solved that problem. That problem is exacerbated with sugars, which are also called carbohydrates, which are also called saccharides. So sugars, carbohydrates, saccharides, they're all the same thing. That problem is much harder. So if you have glucose, glucose, just the simple molecule glucose, glucose can hook together over one trillion, trillion with a T, trillion different ways if you have just six molecules of glucose. How, how do you get just one? You have to have had enzymes to begin with. There's no way to cleanly do this chemistry. So all of this, every step we're, we're lost on. We don't know how to make the glucose. Nobody's ever made even the simple molecule glucose. Nobody's ever made it. Never been made in a prebiotic chemistry sense using things that would be available on an early earth. You can do it today. You can do it with modern analytical and synthetic techniques. However, none of that would have been available on an early earth. So you have to say what's available on an early earth, what kinds of chemistries might have been available. Let's try to put these things together. Nowhere close. Eschen Moser in his whole career could not make uh, uh, could not make ribose, which is one carbon less, which is which is an, easy, an even easier molecule than glucose. And so, so it, it's a it's a problem at every stage. Every stage, it's a problem. Again, that doesn't mean that it. There's no way this could have been done on an early Earth. We just don't know how. And even if we had all the pieces, we wouldn't know how to assemble them in, into a cell because there's so much alignment that is needed not just the 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 covalent detachment where mo one molecule hooks to another but the non-covalent interactions these are two molecules wanting to come close in space to each other there's an ordering to these in cells that is highly complex that we didn't even know about until i don't know 15 years ago or so it's called the leventhal 2.0 paradox how do you get this ordering to go, the non-covalent ordering? The numbers are utterly astronomical as to the combinations that one could come up with, and only a few of those combinations are going to work. That's it. Uh, uh, and the Leventhal 1.0 paradox was how do you take a chain of, of amino acids that is now a polypeptide and have it fold into the right shape it has to be to be an enzyme because you need other enzymes are called foldamers which will fold that 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 enzyme that you want into the right structure because there's too many variations on how these things may may hook up with one another and so all of these are big problems so we're just kind of lost on 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 how life might have formed from, from uh, uh, these basic chemicals. We're just lost on this thing. And to project as if we're close, I think is disingenuous. And I don't think it's accurate to suggest that this to society. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, send me an email and give me a chance to tell you by Zoom why I believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what happens is these suggestions have come so far that most people, there have been polls taken, most people think that scientists have made simple cells in the lab like a bacterium, like, 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 like these uh, prokaryotic uh, uh, cells, that, 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 that these simple cells. People think that scientists have made this. And about a third of the people think that scientists have made simple, have, have made complex animals like frogs. And, and uh, there's nowhere close. We haven't even made the simplest of cells. And people will say, well, the original cells were really, really simple. Well, bioengineers have already figured out how simple a cell could be to work. And so they've already spelled that out for us. And we're nowhere close. Of the about 15 components that you need, do you know how many have been made in a prebiotic sense in a laboratory of the 15 or so components? Zero, none, none of them have been made. Not a single one. Now
not only have, because these are highly complex structures that of, of, of organization of many molecule types. We haven't even made the four basic classes to assemble into those, those, those higher order structures, nor have we made even the simple molecules that build up those chains. And so we're, we're nowhere close to solving this problem. We got a lot of work to do to solve this. Dr. Craig, I, I know you probably have some things that you'd like to say to, to help clarify some of the things that, uh, that Dr. Tewer just said, but I, I, I wanted to get some clarification. Someone in the comments is asking, who are, who are you talking about? Is Eschen Moser, what, what was his first name? Was it Albert or Isaac? Albert. Albert, Albert Eschen, Eschen Moser, one of the great origin of life researchers um, who, who, as Jim said, worked on synthesizing ribose in the laboratory. Excellent. Um, let me underline the importance of enzymes that Jim mentioned. How does the cell manage to do all of these things that we can't do in the laboratory? How, how in the world do these simple cells pull this off? Well, one of the ways is that they have these enzymes, which are protein products that help to um, run the mechanisms of the cell. But here you confront a kind of vicious circularity because the enzymes, the proteins, are themselves the products of the uh, nucleic acids, the, the, the DNA. And yet, uh, in order for the DNA to function, you've got to have the enzymes. So you've got a kind of chicken and the egg scenario here where in nature, in the prebiotic situation, there are no enzymes because there are no living cells to produce them. And yet without the enzymes, you can't have functioning biomolecules like DNA and RNA. And so there's a, a kind of vicious circularity there. So, so we, we did have a question that, that came in. Would you guys mind if we, uh, we turn to one of these questions? We, we've got uh, a chemical engineer in the in the live chat and he's wondering uh he's got a question here he says i'm a lowly chemical engineer so take my question with a grain of salt but some of this sounds to me like irreducible complexity type stuff which seems like an argument from gaps either of you no, have any I, I think that's quite that? incorrect i'll let jim comment on the science but the irreducible complexity argument is an argument that um organisms and organs uh, could not evolve by chance if they have to have all of their parts in place in order to function. Uh, and that is not the argument here at all. The, the argument here is that there is no known way that these um, macromolecules could be synthesized in a prebiotic environment. It, it doesn't have to do with the irreducible complexity of these macromolecules, um, but simply with the fact that there are no known means of these things uh, being synthesized naturalistically. Yeah, I, you know, in, in the sense that irreducible complexity means that you have to have many components in the same place at the same time. So that, that, that's, the, that's often the hard part in an evolutionary scenario. Even in evolution, you have to have many components all happening uh, 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 in the same place at the same time in an evolutionary scenario in that, in that you can't have one piece evolving independently. It's going to be dependent on many other pieces. In a way, that is the same thing that's happening here in an origin of life. If you want to have, if you want to have the building of enzymes, you've got to have all 20 amino acids available in the same place. How do you do that? When there's mixtures, they're just going to randomly hook together and give you this cross-linking problem where that third prong starts hooking in. So you need other enzymes to keep that from happening. But in order for those other enzymes to form, you ha they had to undergo the same reactions. What kept that third prong from hooking in? Nobody knows. Now, if you're going to say that the proteins came together through the help 
of an RNA template. Well, where did the RNA come from? Because you needed enzymes to stitch together the nucleic acids to make the RNA. And then you needed other enzymes to assist each one of those amino acids coming in. And then you needed to have a code, a certain arrangement of those, those uh, uh, the nucleotides in that chain to give you the, the code that you wanted. And the numbers are too big to have happened by chance. So for example, if you have a number of over 10 to the 50th, that is Im so improbable. So one over 10 to the 50th or 10 to the minus 50, that's so improbable that that could not happen in our universe. That couldn't happen in our universe. There's not enough time in the 14 billion years. Even if you had a hundred of our universes, there's not enough time if you're up at, uh, up in it, one in 10 to the 50. So if you even just had a, a, a protein that was 200 long, so you have 20, 20, to, uh, uh, 20 to the power of 200, that is way, way bigger than 10 to the 50th. So you got 20 amino acids, 200 long units, that's 20 to the 200. That's way, way too much. You can't get in that space you can't get the, the, the combinations that you need to give you what you need to do any sort of synthetic work. And among those, you're going to have many that do degradative work, that degrade things. So this is what we're talking about. So in a sense, I, I understand what you're talking about, that, that, yeah, you need many components in the same place at the same moment in time. And remember, these are just molecules that would be in a pool somewhere or something. And how did they all get in the same pool? How did you get the sugars together with the amino acids? Because if you were trying to make those sugars in the presence of amino acids, you never would have gotten the sugars in the first place because the amino acids have the same type of alcohol groups, many of them hanging off. And those amines would compete in the same types of reactions. So you'd have to keep them separated. And so you have to have all of these separated from one another when you're trying to make them and then later all come back together. How do you envision this? So it, it, it is a real problem. And as far as the gaps, if you mean a, a God of the gaps type argument, no, we're not suggesting that because we don't know, we don't know how it happened, that it must be God. I, I have never done that. I never mm. suggested in that way. I just say that because we don't know how to do it, we just don't know how to do it, period. That's not to say that therefore God must have done it, nor is that to say that we'll never be able to do it. I've never used that type of argument. I'm just saying I don't know how to do it right now. And, and it's not only that I don't know how to do it, it's getting, the target is getting further away. And why do I say that? It's not like, okay, well, we've learned so much in the last 20 years, we're a little bit closer to solving this. No, what I argue is we're further away from solving this. We're further than we were 20 years ago. We're further than we were 50 years ago. And the reason I say that is because 50 years ago, we didn't know about the interactome problem, this problem of the non-covalent alignment that's going to be needed. So because we, as soon as we learned that cells have that and are, depend on that, now our target has moved way, way out. It's moved much further away. So the target has moved further away. Not that the cell got more complex, but our understanding of the cellular complexity uh, 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 allowed us to see that, wow, we are not nowhere close to this because you know, in, in, in the 1920s, they thought a cell was just a bunch of protoplasm, a bunch of stuff randomly wiggling around in there. But now we know a, a, a cell is a factory. It's, it's highly ordered, highly orchestrated. You have so many enzymes. You have thousands of enzymes working, which are nature's little nanomachines to put this thing together. And so the complexity has become so vast that the target has moved further away. So we're actually not getting closer with time. We're getting further away with time, which generally means that we're very far away from solving a problem. Dr. Tewer, you asked a question to Dr. Craig a little bit earlier about why, why do you think, why does he think that uh, scientists are just, are, are not willing to admit that, 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 that we're so far away from this. And I was, yes, I was and thinking he, and, a little and bit. He, he, ne he never really answered my question. He, he started 
going in and clarifying uh, uh, <laughs> scientific points. So I just want to point out that you're pointing it out, yes, that the philosopher skirted the question. Well, what, no, I wasn't trying <laughs> I, to point that out. What, I, uh, I, that's I true. Was trying... I did skirt the question because I'm not prepared to psychoanalyze other persons to talk about their motivations. Uh, I, I don't do that. I assess arguments. Um, I don't try to, uh, to psychoanalyze those who disagree with me. But my point was that Jim's opinion is not a minority radical opinion. It's a common opinion in origin of life research that we have no understanding of how life originated on this planet. And I think that's really important for our listeners to grasp. Now, Jim's last comments give me a nice uh, opportunity to introduce the theological perspective that I am eager to talk about. Uh, and so let me say, and this is in reply to Kevin as well, like Jim, I am not offering an argument for God's existence based on the origin of life. Jim doesn't do that because he's a methodological naturalist. As a scientist, he doesn't do theology. The reason that I'm not doing it is because I'm not doing what's called natural theology. Natural theology is that branch of theology that it attempts to argue for God's existence uh, from religiously neutral aspects of the universe in which we live. I'm doing systematic theology, which begins with the data of Scripture, and with that in hand, then comes to the deliverances of modern science and says, how can we, as Christian theologians, best integrate our theology with the data of contemporary science concerning origin of life? And with respect to that question, origin of life theorists tend to fall into two broad camps, what we could call necessitists and contingentists. Necessitists think that life is the inevitable and necessary product of the laws of physics and chemistry. Given a universe controlled by our physical and chemical laws, it is inevitable that somewhere life will originate. Contingentists, by contrast, say, no, the existence of life on Earth is a highly contingent event that depends upon a conspiracy of highly improbable conditions that might not have obtained on any other planet in the observable universe. So you've got necessitists and contingentists with regard to the origin of life. And it seems to me that the theologian can adopt either one of these perspectives. You could be what I would call a theological necessitist. Namely, you would hold that in the beginning, God decreed the laws of physics and chemistry that would uh, control our universe, as well as setting the finely tuned values of those constants and co quantities to make the universe life permitting. And therefore, given the laws of chemistry and physics that God has established, it is necessary that life will evolve. That would be one theological perspective. On the other hand, you could be a theological contingentist. And here I think there are two forms that the, uh, of contingentism that theologian might advocate. One would be creationism. The theologian might say that these highly improbable events upon which the origin of life depends are so astronomically improbable that they cannot be reasonably faced. Uh, and that therefore God has miraculously intervened in the sequence of natural causes to bring about the origin of life. And probably the most plausible form of this view would be some kind of progressive creationism where God intervenes periodically in the history of the earth to bring about through supernatural input events that would not in all probability have ever transpired had he not done so. That would be creationism. The other form of theological contingentism would be what I call supervisionism. 
And this would be the view that without miraculously intervening in the series of secondary causes, God has nevertheless providentially uh, supervised the unfolding of the historical processes so that uh, this highly, highly improbable event would in fact come to pass on earth. And probably the most plausible version of theological supervisionism would be Molinism. That is to say, God, by his middle knowledge, knew what would come about were he to establish certain pre-existing conditions. Usually, middle knowledge and Molinism is applied to God's providence over the free acts of human beings, but it equally applies to the situations in nature. God knew that if these contingent circumstances were created, then these highly improbable events would ensue. And so it seems to me that the theologian could be a a, a contingentist either of the creationist variety or of the supervisionist variety. When you assess these three points of view, I think probably theological necessitism is highly implausible. There just don't seem to be those intermediate stages leading to the synthesis of the building blocks of the building blocks or the uh, building blocks of life or the first cell that would have to exist in order to say that this is the inevitable and necessary effect of the laws of physics and chemistry. So I think we ought to go with some form of theological contingentism, either creationism or uh, supervisionism. Okay, uh, we we did have a, a a very substantial super chat that was just sent in, and this guy's been sort of criticizing the stream the entire time. I don't know what his background is. Uh, Paul Rimmers' his name. He says, "Hi, Jim. So true that we are very far from a solution. We don't know what a solution would even look like. Isn't that some progress? Do you dismiss all recent prebiotic systems chemistry, or do you think some small progress is being made?" Well, Paul, good to talk with you again. You 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 are a you you are a devoted fan wherever I am. You are, and uh, <laughs> uh, so so um, yeah. We you know even that you are saying you work in the area of origin of life, and when you say we are very far from a solution, that gives me that 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 makes me feel like like um, I've 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 accomplished something that there are people who are working in the area of origin of life and agreeing with me that we are very far from a solution. When you say, will you dismiss all recent prebiotic systems chemistry? I don't dismiss all of anything. I mean, I'm I'm certainly not even aware of of all uh, uh, systems chemistry. I think that that, uh, um, some of the things that are being done are really highly improbable that these things are are occurring this way. So for example, the work of John Sutherland, and I, and I respect John Sutherland's talent as an organic chemist very much. The molecules that he has made with one hand tied behind his back, meaning that he's (laughs) restricting himself to prebiotic chemistry conditions, I think is not realistic in, in the sense that uh, he does use relay synthesis. Like many people use relay synthesis. Uh, he can't deal with some of these mixture problems, and he brings in, you, you know, bubbling of, of dropping water onto calcium carbide to happen to generate acetylene nearby so that you can make uh, 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 acryl- uh, uh, um, the, 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 these vinyl, vinyl monomers. I mean, the, these, and, and then the very, very careful adjustments of pH up and down and keeping something cold and then all of a sudden having to warm it up, that these are not even realistic. So, so um, uh, to me, I, it, 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 it seems hard not to dismiss those. And according to some in the community, they, they agree with me. Certainly Shapiro did uh, uh, th- this, this idea of, of uh, this very, very careful chemistry. So I, but I'm not dismissing everything. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. But I, I, you know, you even said we are very far and you capitalized very. So you're agreeing with me. So I feel good, Paul, that you, you and I are agreeing now. So, okay, one last thing that I'd like to do before we close out the the show today, we're, we're about at the hour mark and, and that's about all the time that we're going to have today. But I noticed, or I, I was... 
it, it occurred to me during the stream that wh what I've got here, I've got two very important figures in terms of Christian evangelism, but the two of you have very different approaches to evangelism. So what I'd like to do is, is Dr. Tour, I'd like to get what your what is your approach to evangelism when you attempt to evangelize? And then I'd like to get Dr. Craig's uh, response to that and, and kind of explanation of what, uh, of what he does and, and kind of compare and contrast the, the two approaches. Well, I preach the simple gospel. Uh, the presentation that I, I just tell people what I, the message that I heard, how my sin was exposed to me. It was clear that I am a sinner and that, that uh, uh, there is nothing that I could do to save myself from being a sinner. That Jesus gave his life on my behalf and that he died to give his life on my behalf, and then he rose from the grave three days later, and I take them through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is the way I preach the gospel. And if I go one week, if I go one week without leading somebody to the Lord, I, I feel like it was a wasted week. If I go one week without leading somebody to Jesus in this way, and uh, um, everybody that I share with, I get them uh, hooked up in a 13-week one-on-one Bible study with a friend of mine, and um, uh, and then I get them in a daily Bible reading program. And so this is what I try to do, and that's how I evangelize. I never discuss origin of life. I never discuss age of the universe. I never discuss evolution. That is nowhere close to what, what I do when I share the gospel. How about you, Dr. Craig? What is your approach to evangelism? Um Jim Tour is a fruitful and accomplished personal evangelist. I, I am jealous of you, Jim, for the effectiveness of your personal ministry in leading people to Christ. Um, my approach is public evangelism. I want to try to reach as many university students as I can and it became clear to me very early on that the most effective forum for evangelism on the university campus is public debate, where you will have an event that brings together a Christian and a non-Christian to uh, discuss fundamental issues like, does God exist? Who was Jesus? What's the basis of moral values? And in this way, I try to present the gospel in the context of giving an intellectual defense of the Christian world and life view, uh, so as to try to open the minds of seekers and unbelieving students to the possibility that the gospel might really be true. Yeah, I, I wish I could say... Cameron, Cameron could I just mention, yeah. it's because of people like, like uh, uh, William Lane Craig that I... I can see so many people in conversation coming to the Lord because it's mm. people like Dr. Craig that have laid the groundwork. One man sows, another man reaps. And so many people have gone before me to lay this groundwork. And it's like I just walk in and I just, just <laughs> reap what all these people have worked at for many years. That's actually what I was about to uh, to ask you about. Well, uh, thank you both for for coming on to to talk about this subject. It's there were some people at the very beginning of this saying that this is like two titans coming together on this on this one subject, and it was like almost like Christmas for them. So this is uh, this has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you, thank you both for for joining us for this discussion. Uh, the pleasure has been mine entirely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, Dr. Craig, you'll be here. At, what is it in in October to talk about the arguments for the existence of God? So maybe we could yeah. all get together. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and uh, and hang out then you'll you'll be in Houston. So uh, well well again thank you both for for coming on and for discussing this. Thank you all for joining us and watching. And we'll see you in the next Capturing Christianity video. See you guys later. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.